I work in an old building in downtown Austin. This poster is right outside of her office. And it's really fascinating to me because it actually shows the very heart of Austin, six in Congress, but 100 years ago. Now, one morning I was drinking coffee, looking at this poster, really enthralled with all the activity and the traffic that you see here. And I got to wondering if this guy was actually about to eat it on the side of a streetcar. <laughs> but then it kind of dawned on me, wait, what happened to all our streetcars? Now, about this time is when uh, a coworker of mine and a good friend, Jared Ficklin, walked up. And I mentioned the same thing to Jared. And Jared went on what I guess can best be described as a rant about eminent domain, all the issues with modern mass transit, and, uh, of course, flying cars. I think he started out with saying, you can't solve a modern problem with a 200-year-old solution. Now, this really uh, kind of resonated with me. But I want to say, just right from the start, I believe in mass transit. Mass transit, once you give people uh, the ability to choose a mode of transportation that fits their lifestyle and their budget, you create a broader, more inclusive city. And then, of course, there's not sitting in traffic, right? Now, I'm a designer, and as a designer, when you start any kind of systematic design, you always want to start with the experience that a user wants or a user needs. And for us, uh, traffic is a good place to start with that. Um, but if you look at, um, if you look at uh, essentially what the real barriers are for mass transit, it essentially comes down to one thing, and that's fear. And through our research, we actually found that there were essentially two problem points. Uh, people are actually scared of schedules. There's a fear of scheduling. Uh, people don't want to be conformed to somebody else's schedules. The other, the second biggest fear that we found was essentially a fear of crowding or a lack of personal space. Because in your car, you have this safe place for both you and your belongings, and you have seven cup holders. Uh, <laughs> but on mass transit, you're constantly crowded onto a train, and you're constantly having to guard both you and your personal belongings. So when we talked to people in the uh, western and southern U.S., what we essentially found was people essentially had a real fear of a scheduling and uh, a fear of crowding. Now, what if I told you there was a, an industry uh, out there in the field of mass transit that actually competes based on capacity? And I'm talking about the ski industry. So this is the Zillatar ski area in Austria. Now, it currently holds the world record in lift capacity. It can actually carry, with a system of 174 uh, lifts and gondolas, can carry 293,000 people per hour. Now, if you actually run the system on a 24-hour basis, you would essentially be carrying 7 million people per day. Now, if this wasn't a ski resort and people were actually carried back down the mountain instead of skiing down, you would be carrying 14 million people per day. Now, to put this kind of max capacity in perspective, the New York City subway only carries 5.3 million people on any given workday. So you're talking about moving a whole lot of people. Now, I'm not saying that chairlifts are necessarily our ideal solution for mass transit, because they would just be <laughs> way too many dropped iPhones, right? <laughs> but the ski industry is a great place to look at uh, as far as inspiration goes for what mass transit could be. And one of the innovations that you'll find in the ski industry is actually called high-speed detachable gondolas. Now, these are enclosed cars attached to a cable, supported by towers, um, cruising along at about 15 miles an hour. Now, they're called detachable because as they come into a station or a stop, they actually release from the cable and slow down to just about walking speed, but they never actually stop. Now, this allows people to actually uh, load or unload off these cars across a flat level surface, and then the car accelerates back up to line speed and reattaches to the cable. Now, this operation is continuous. The cars never stop as they come through the station. So that essentially means that if you see a car come through with some creepy old looking guy with a beard in it like me, you wait two seconds, and you catch the next car that glides through the station. <laughs> now, because they're detachable, it also gives us a bunch of other advantages, right? So since they're detachable, we can actually remove cars in real time from the system for cleaning or maintenance, or add cars to the system during peak demand, like rush hour. Now, all of this adds up to give us essentially a new form of mass transit called urban cable. It was a pretty picture there. I promise you it looked nice. Um, but this new form of mass transit called urban cable, there it is. See how beautiful that was? That was worth the wait. 
It'll look nicer the second time. <laughs> okay, so it's a new form of mass transit called urban cable. Slide. There we go. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so it's a new form of mass transit called urban cable, if you haven't gotten that yet. <laughs> now, we're not saying um, necessarily, if you start looking at cities and how we got to where we are today, um, you have to look back at historically. So if you go back to the 1800s when uh, cities like Austin were first uh, developed during the rapid western expansion of the U.S., cities were built so quickly that urban planners essentially went out and designed uh, streets around the mode of transportation of the day, horse and buggies, and they put them on a strict grid. So over time, what has happened is essentially we still have that same grid and those street widths, but the street widths haven't actually grown with us. So we're way past horse and buggies these days, but we're still living with the same street widths and uh, grid system. Now what this actually means in form of uh, mass transit is essentially that you have uh, your street widths, but to em employ something like a, ma a new form of mass transit, like surface rail, you're actually displacing cars, displacing capacity, um, essentially to add uh, a new form of mass transit. But if you look up and all that empty space that's above the street and the sidewalks, there's actually much more capacity there um, that you could actually employ urban cable, essentially a second layer to the city, and you wouldn't displace any existing uh, traffic or capacity. Now, beyond just... Uh, pure capacity, uh, you also have to look at the advantages from a construction perspective. Like when you start employing light rail or surface-based rail, you're actually fighting for and digging up every uh, foot of street uh, along any given uh, corridor to actually employ the rail system. But urban cable is essentially a lot lighter than that. It's modular, so you can put in a series of foundations for towers, then employ the cables and then attach the cars. So it's a great cost saving and it's something that can actually be done much faster than tearing up entire streets. But there's also another kind of cost advantage or operational advantage. It's in the air. So we can literally span uh, any kind of geographic barriers such as rivers, uh, buildings, or freeways at no additional cost. You don't have to build a multi-million dollar bridge to run a train across the river. Now how much does this actually all save on cost wise? If you look at, on average, most cities in the U.S. spend about $100 million per mile for surface-based rail. And proof of that is actually right here in Austin. The proposed urban light rail for phase one is estimated to cost $550 million just for five and a half miles of track. Now, to put that kind of in a, a little bit of perspective, urban cable, we could actually build 14 miles of luxurious air-conditioned urban cable for that same cost even if we cross the river five times. So what would all this kind of look like? Um, I was able to actually assemble a crazy guerrilla team of designers um, that were willing and passionate enough about this to work on it uh, on their own free time after hours. And we decided to devise a system, uh, our vision for mass transit here in Austin. Uh, but the first things first, we had to come up with a name. So we decided to give uh, this system uh, a name that kind of seemed fitting to Austin. Austin prides itself on being weird, so we decided to give it a slightly weird name. We call it the Wire. Now, the Wire is our vision for a user-centered, practical mass transit system for cities like Austin. But essentially, this is our vision uh, for mass transit here in Austin. Now, if you're looking at um, a city like Austin, uh, there's a couple uh, planned uh, modes of mass transit, plus our existing mass transit that we have here today. Uh, the wire can run along the exact same routes as a proposed urban light rail, but we can also go places that the urban light rail simply can't go. And that creates uh, not only routes, but experiences. So if you're wondering what it would be like to actually fly in a ski lift in Texas, um, run you through a scenario here. So imagine you fly into Austin, you land at the airport, and you roll right out to the parking garage, the connected parking garage, with all your luggage. You walk 
and roll right onto the first car as it glides through the station and you glide out. Now, you don't have to wait for any schedules. You don't have to um, wait in any kind of long lines. And you don't have any guilt about hogging an entire car for just you and your luggage because there's another car gliding through the station about two seconds behind you. Now, all this technology came from the ski industry, which was designed to go up and down these crazy mountains. So, if you actually think about how that would apply here in an experiential standpoint, it gets really interesting. So in Austin, you would leave the Austin airport and you would skim just above the ground, going through all our green belts, along our waterways, and all the kind of beautiful landscapes that we've been so blessed with here. But occasionally, you would start drifting upward and you would break free from the treetops and be presented with dramatic vistas of the entire city. Now that is a first impression for a city, much better than the black windows of a subway car or a bus window stuck in rush hour. Now, along your way, you're actually going to pass through other stations. So as you glide through these other stations, you don't have to stop to wait for people to get on or off like you would on a train. You simply keep gliding along, and soon you're back up to speed. So here in Austin, just 19 minutes after you leave the airport, you'll be gliding into a rooftop station on uh, the roof of the convention center downtown. Now, commuters would also get this same kind of crazy experience on a daily basis, but they also get to enjoy the benefits of continuous operation. Now, that doesn't seem maybe that impactful until you start looking at the whole fear of scheduling point. So since these things are constantly moving through stations, uh, this is why ski resorts can actually tell you from any point in line exactly how long it's going to be until you get on the gondola. And uh, since we're above uh, traffic lights here and it's continuously moving, we know it down to the exact minute how long your ride's going to take. So there's no more excuses for traffic, which is maybe a bad thing. Um, and of course, uh, gondolas actually provide space. So it gives you a less crowded environment, but it actually doesn't necessarily take away um, from that by crowding you with 80 to 100 of your closest friends, right? You can ride one of these alone if you wait, or you can ride with others, the creepy guy with a beard in a car if you want, or uh, you can roll your bike on. So there's actually uh, room enough there for uh, your bike. But the advantages to uh, urban cable go way beyond, essentially, uh, just what the gondolas themselves can do. There's opportunities here architecturally. So since these things can actually change elevation, go up and down, we can drop these down to the surface and actually have surface stops just like a train stop. We can also integrate these things into existing um, architecture that's already in place. So you could actually integrate them with a parking garage or any other kind of existing architecture. You could even span intersections and capture the dead airspace above an intersection with a stop. Now, you could also integrate um, the urban cable system into existing high-rise buildings or retails. Now, this all together kind of adds up to build a community around commuting. And design is also an important part of that. So just look at the name we chose. The Wire. Now, it sounds a little funny to say, and the slides look a little funny today, but um, natural language when you're branding a mass transit system is actually plays a very critical role in wayfinding. So think about telling your friends how to ride a system. With this, you would simply just say, hey, let's just catch the wire. Giving uh, a friend direction somewhere is just as simple as saying, catch wire one to SoCo. If you're trying to give somebody complex directions to maybe something like ACL, it's as simple as saying, hey, catch, catch the wire to the convention center, then grab wire two to Zilker Park. You're talking about multiple transfers, stops, uh, really complex route, but it's very simple to say when you use natural language. Now, since it's so simplistic and easy to do, you can actually distill all of this down visually into visual breadcrumbs, which would make direction sets uh, language neutral. So keep in, in mind uh, how simple the directions could be, uh, we can actually extend out from that. So if you think about stations, lines and stations, uh, they're actually very powerful representations of a city. People uh, get very emotional about their stops because it actually represents them. It makes a statement about, this is where I live. This is who I am. And design is an important part of that. Because with good design, with good design, an innovative mass transit system like the wire is more uh, than just transit. It becomes an iconic representation of our city. It becomes 
a part of our culture. And when it's part of our culture, it'll be adopted and used. Now, Austin wouldn't be the first city in the world to actually um, employ urban cable. There's lots of cities around the world that have done just that. But we have learned from those guys, and Austin would be the first to employ it on this kind of grand scale. So in Austin, we have a phrase that I'm sure um, a lot of people you're familiar with um, that we'll get to in a second. Um, but all this means essentially is that you don't have to use your great-grandfather's technology to solve a modern problem. With innovation, oftentimes it's not about creating something wholly new. It's just about adapting something else that's already there. Urban cable is not new. It's something that we can adapt. So in Austin, we have that saying, right? Keep Austin weird. And that just shows how proud we are of our city and how unique our city actually is. But today, I would hope that everyone would leave here actually saying, instead, get Austin wired. Thank you. Whoa!